Okay, Jim, 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 what's up, everybody? We got uh, another VIP interview uh, today here at Web Summit. Such an exciting event. We got a lot of OGs in crypto. And, you know, one of the things um, that's really important and a lot of, actually, one of the main benefits people say is own your own data. What's so important about NFTs? Why do they call me the NFT professor? I've been talking about data ownership for a while. But the real OG here and who's really behind this data ownership, as you can see from this beautiful network, necklace, which is like the most unique necklace I've ever seen, <laughs> is Brittany Kaiser. So uh, we, uh, so uh, Brittany's here to talk about data ownership and what they're doing um, in the world here. So she was just on stage, on the main stage uh, here at Web Summit. So tell us why data ownership is so important and what got you passionate about it. So I really became passionate about data while I was working for an unethical data science company called Cambridge Analytica, where I eventually became a whistleblower after I quit the company. Uh, and figuring out the way that the entire global multi-trillion dollar uh, personal data markets work and how untransparent and how easy it is for people to be abused and targeted with their data where they did not consent to it being collected or used in that way, I really felt like data ownership, both the technical ability to own your data, prevent it from going places, or to be able to consent to sharing pseudonymized or anonymous data is the most important concept in the world and it's only web 3 tools it's only blockchain based tools that really allow you to own your data track and trace where it goes create permission structures on how it is used create smart contracts that self execute and take your data back when you no longer want to be sharing it all of these tools are so incredibly important for our human rights for our civil rights for us to be able to protect our privacy and to make sure that if our data is being monetized that we're getting a slice of the pie no. Oh, imagine that. It sounds like some ideal uh, world, you know, some utopia where we can own our data. And, and some utopia also where whistleblowers actually survive. Um, how did you get through this? I mean, it seems, I know that whistleblowers have, like, as we know with Edward Snowden, who's type of whistleblower, um, uh, obviously we know that Julian Assange, uh, stay strong, Julian. Uh, uh, we're with you, uh, is still in, in, in prison because of this, and we know the power, that the powers that were behind uh, Cambridge Analytica. How uh, did you get through this? Because it's, it seems amazingly strong that you were able to be here today and that you were able to, you know, double down on this uh, this righteous vision that you have, you know? How, did, how, does, how does one do that? How does one whistle blow and it come out on the other side like you have in a better way? It's amazing. I mean, honestly, it's a bit of a miracle, uh, to be fair. Uh, I didn't know how this was going to go. You never know when you decide to become a whistleblower what's going to happen to you legally or physically. Uh, you're not sure whether you are going to be safe, whether your family is going to be safe, whether you're going to get uh, prosecuted for something that you didn't do. Uh, I was just lucky that I was whistleblowing on companies and not a government because it's illegal to whistleblow on a government or a military in most countries, especially the United States. Uh, but it's actually permitted by law and protected to whistleblow against companies if they are if they have broken the law uh, so if they've committed fraud or waste or other uh, other categories that whistleblowing protection law actually affords you uh, to be able to do this so your NDAs become invalid when the company has committed a crime that you have evidence of okay uh, so that's really uh, I'm a human rights lawyer and I studied whistleblowing for a long time so I actually understood the process I knew what I needed to do in order to be protected under the law I worked with incredible lawyers to go through this process, the best human rights lawyers in the world uh, that really helped me to make sure I was doing things in the correct way, that I was presenting all the evidence and never never over-inflating or deterring from what my evidence actually said, which was that Cambridge Analytica and Facebook committed crimes against their, uh, against their clients and their users and against the general public uh, using data in those ways. And so, uh, unfortunately, not a lot of whistleblowers have my experience. Uh, not a lot of whistleblowers get 
to write a globally published book or have a, a, a famous documentary team make one of the most popular pieces of content Netflix has ever hosted. Like that is that is very rare, and it's why I spend a lot of time helping whistleblowers because a lot of people decide to keep this uh, to keep the whistleblowing process private and not become a public whistleblower to protect themselves and their families and to make sure that they can get another job uh, because a lot of whistleblowers are, are blacklisted and physically targeted, let alone targeted with frivolous lawsuits and uh, a lot of other legal complications that end up taking all of their time and money and mental health away. Uh, so I do assist a lot of whistleblowers in going through this process, whether publicly or privately, how to report uh, how to report scammers and fraud uh, to different government agencies, what lawyers to work with. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I actually originally started coming to Web Summit because right after I became a whistleblower, Web Summit invited me and Edward Snowden to co-headline uh, Web Summit, which was really amazing opportunity. And now both at Web Summit Rio and here, I've gotten to spend a lot of time with Chelsea Manning, which has been amazing. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's here, which is so great. <laughs> and, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, yeah, I think that the CEO of, the, uh, of their organization contacted me named Harry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we might uh, interview uh, uh, Chelsea as well. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of whistleblowers. I mean, I had uh, uh, worked in business ethics and uh, in a while when I was a professor a long time ago. So I have known about that as well. And uh, my partner is a human rights lawyer who you just met, Angelica. So um, that's really important to us. Now, I want to ask you a question about the future because AI has taken over, right? Generative AI. There's a lot of content, a lot of text, a lot more opportunities um, for scams, for uh, you know people that are using data like Cambridge Analytica or other players now. It's just uh, manifoldly higher and bigger. I mean, as far as the importance of owning your own data, now, especially in the age of generative AI, how important is that? Even Is that even more important now with AI and with this direction? Or would you say, oh, it's always been kind of the same importance? I mean, data ownership has always uh, been the most important foundation of any technology is becoming ethical. Uh, so now that we are in a space where AI is running our daily lives and where it's impossible to tell what is real or fake anymore uh, in media or social media, we have seen the exasperated effects of us not solving the data protection and data ownership problem in the first place. We still don't have federal data protection law or privacy law in the United States. They've decided to not implement any of the 35 plus digital asset laws that we wrote in Wyoming or any of the privacy laws that have been passed around the world. And so if we don't have basic definitions on who owns data, how data is transferred, who has a fiduciary responsibility, who has the custodianship rights, who is, has the ability to transfer or, uh, or has the permission structures in order to transfer data, we haven't solved that in law everywhere in the world yet. And now the technologies that allow us to do that are not being used in AI. If we knew where which data was owned and who it was owned by and where it was going and we could track and trace it, we would know what AI was real and what wasn't. We would be able to detect bias in AI. We'd be able to figure out where the problems in the algorithms actually came from. But because we don't know what is real or what is fake in these algorithms, we don't know where it came from, we don't know wh where the, the AI has actually got the data from, therefore it makes all of this really impossible to solve at this point. So we need to start at the very beginning, which is define data ownership and permission structures and all of these rights. And then we can build on top of that, how does that data get entered into algorithms? How do those algorithms get layered to become an AI? Okay, well, then we can start to really talk about what is ethical, what is transparent, what is protecting people's personal data, what is protecting copyrighted data and intellectual property, which is, has been one of the biggest conversations on chat GPT and it making things up and, and all of these other uh, AI tools that are stealing things from artists and writers and musicians. We would be able to solve that if we were just using Web3 tools for data ownership in the first place. Okay, so when there, when people talk about AI being the most important thing in generative AI, oh, well, you know, I've seen a lot of shift from people who were Web3 experts and now they're 
AI experts, but what you're saying is that there is no future, real future, unless we want to be in like a 1984 type of totalitarian state, unless we link these new laws and uh, considerations of Web3. So without Web3, our future's looking bleak in a way, Absolutely. and also without the private ownership of data. So last question I have for you. I know you're very busy, uh, Brittany, and thank you so much for the time. Um, you look just fantastic today. I love the outfit today. Um, in relation to the CBDCs, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people look at that as a way, f obviously, for the governments to, you know, capture our data, uh, you know, follow us around, things like that. Do you think that there will be a digital euro or a digital dollar that, you know, is, you know, protects privacy or that enables um, people to have like cash-like transactions or Bitcoin-like transactions um, or ZK, SNARK type transactions um, in the future? Or do you see CBDCs as something that's really problematic? I mean, C CBDCs are definitely coming uh, and they are definitely problematic. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people will develop tools around CDBCs in order to have private transactions with them because, again, governments are going to need to use CDBCs in order to remain internationally competitive, especially in the United States and in, in, and in the EU, making sure that they have a digitally pegged uh, public currency that can be used as, uh, that can be used in international trade. Like, it's so incredibly important. And if the digital UN is what wins, that's not good for the rest of us. <laughs> so, uh, so I find it, it's fine that they're being developed, but it is important for human rights and privacy that we have alternative currencies that are not controlled by the government and central banks so that we can have fully private transactions, so that we can make sure that no one can turn off our money. <laughs> um, <it's laughs> for example? <laughs> it's pretty important. Um, uh, a little. <laughs> right. But we, you know, we don't have those controls over fiat currency right now, so we shouldn't expect to have those controls over a CDBC. They're just digitizing a fiat system uh, using Web3 tools. They're not creating a, a, a cryptocurrency in the way that we Web3 natives think of it. Right. That's okay. not what it is. Okay. So, guys, obviously you see how amazing Brittany Kaiser is. That's why she's got a Netflix documentary and a global, globally recognized book out. Um, so, if, if people want to learn more about you, they can go to your website or they can just type in Google um, and find more about you. They can go to Netflix, check out this documentary. It's amazing. Um, she's the one who uh, blew the whistle on the Cambridge Analytica, which we know that was a whole big issue with the uh, 2016 election and much, much, much more. So um, amazing work that you've been doing. Um, I'm very proud to have this uh, interview with you. And just uh, let us know um, your website address so people can go directly um, to that to find more about your work and what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can find out more about me on ownyourdata.foundation. That's my nonprofit where we teach uh, digital literacy globally. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, tokenization of real world assets, which is the main thing I'm concentrating on these days, teaching people about data ownership by owning actual physical assets with Web3 technologies, it's chateauchy.com, so chateau, French spelling of castle, and then shi.com. Uh, nice. So please check it out there and feel free to follow me on uh, on X uh, at, at Own Your Data Now. <laughs> own Your Data Now on X. And uh, on most, uh, m most social media platforms. Platforms. I'm dash own your data or own your data now. All right. So if you have problems spelling Chateau in French, then you can just do own your data now on the social media or dive in Brittany Kaiser. A real pleasure to have you on Crypto Mondays. Thank you so much. All right. Cheers. Cool. Cheers.